What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 worst WWE stables ever. Now, sometimes creative Vince McMahon, whoever's involved, come up with a cool, dope stable that ends up getting everyone in the group over. The recent one we can think of right now is um uh the shield. They all individually ended up getting over in their own unique way. Um, hell, even the bloodline situation. Granted, Jimmy and Jay have always been a staple in the tag team. But when the bloodline was first being created, you had the, the main event, Jay Uso. That was a thing. Like him being more spotlighted and then the story of of them you know being a better tag team solo socolo being added into the mix him getting the spotlight and shine he's getting you know these stables obviously you know there's a leader and usually the stables there to help the leader but it's supposed to be able to get everyone over in their individual ways and then there's sometimes where there's just stables that just don't work it's just is no one really gets over if anything everyone gets hurt by the, by association of the stable itself so we're gonna check out some of these that did not work appreciate all the love and support you guys for showing on the channel let's get right into this man stables groups factions whatever you want to call them in wwe they are supposed to be forces to be reckoned with and WWE, to their credit, have been responsible for some of the best in the history of, of the course. business. When they get it right, they really get it right. But when they get it wrong, oh dearie me. We've, we've seen Rather this than one. careers being made and legacies forged, being involved in one of WWE's very bad stables can Wait, be what, the what does the shirt say? Job squad? Oh, bro, that's... That's awful of some performers or else linger as a metaphorical steel chair to beat them over the head with. Strength in numbers, my the ass. Squad. I'm Adam Pacitti <laughs> from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 worst WWE stables. Join us, or don't in these cases. Number 10, The League of Nations. Mm. On paper, a faction featuring Seamus, Rusev, Wade Barrett, and Alberto worked. Del Rio should have half bad. It's just a quarter bad with Del Rio being that quarter. The League of Nations took four of WWE's dependable internationals and banded them together to spread anti-American sentiment, a simple concept I'm sure we can all get behind. So just what happens when an Englishman, an Irishman, a Bulgarian, and a Mexican walk into a wrestling ring together? A whole lot of nothing, sadly, as the League of Nations seemed to exist for one primary reason, which was to assist in Operation Get Roman Reigns Over. Amazingly, and grouping them together the managed to collectively lower the value. And that's the problem. Once again, I talked about this at the beginning of the video. It hurt everybody. Like, stables that ultimately hurt everybody in it, this is one of them. They weren't created to push them. They were created only to get Roman over. And it still didn't work. Not at that time, at least. You of everyone involved as the League of Nations had no clear purpose, no credibility, and the four men in the group were unhappy with their creative direction, or lack thereof. Seamus, Barrett, Rusev, and Del Rio have all since been outspoken about their frustration and disappointment with their six-month alliance, and as far as their WWE runs are concerned anyway, only the Celtic Warrior ever truly recovered from it. Facts. Number nine, The Cabinet. Saddled with the stigma of being a career mostly babyface mid-carder, JBL needed all the help he could get to establish himself as a top-line heel when he was thrust into the position in 2004. The shocking angles, heated promos, mm -hmm. and feud and subsequent WWE title victory over Eddie Guerrero certainly helped legitimize him, and I'm sure WWE probably thought that making him the leader of his own stable would only enhance his reputation further. Not and as so, much. President JBL assembled his cabinet, adding Chief of Staff Orlando Jordan, Co Secretaries of Defense, the Basham <laughs> Brothers, and Image Consultant Amy Weber. The cabinet acted as warm bodies to be beaten up by the babyfaces trying to get their hands on the champ, but mm -hmm. OJ, Doug, Danny, and Amy weren't exactly over with the audience, and their matches and segments routinely fell really flat. They accomplished next to nothing before gradually disbanding, with Amy quitting IRL after just a few months on the road, and the Bashams kayfabe handing in their notice not too long after. Damn. By that point, JBL had lost the strap, and so it was basically just him and Orlando, with fixed 
mixer Jillian Hall temporarily added to the mix before the whole thing was scrapped altogether. Number eight. Yeah, it didn't get as over in the sense of heel heat wise. Other than JBL, JBL was the star attraction of that whole thing. But a good stable, you want to have like the people that are around that person also enhance and help them out as well and help themselves out career wise, you know? So it's the Mean Street Posse. I will confess that the idea of a group of Shane McMahon's buddies from the mean streets of Greenwich, Connecticut, That's... wrestling in sweater vests and slacks was a funny one. That's funny with, on anyway. paper. <laughs> Two thirds of the so-called mean street posse, Pete Gass and Rodney, were legitimate buddies with the boss's son, while the other member, Joey Abs, was a former enhancement talent and the only one with any actual in-ring experience. Damn. The posse originally had a couple of other members, Willie Green and Billy P, before they were whittled down to a three. Mostly used in backstage segments or to run interference for Shane, the posse wrestled the occasional mostly awful match, one of which against Stooges, Patterson and Briscoe is inexplicably one of the most viewed matches in the history of Raw. Damn. The posse's collective lack of training meant that their matches were mostly rotten and they didn't really have much reason for being once they split from McMahon, mostly being used as punching bags or hardcore title fodder. WWE Damn. evidently didn't see much of a future for them since they were shipped off to developmental league Memphis Championship Wrestling in late 2000, never to return. Number seven, uh, the Mexicals. The theory, Mexicals. An cruiserweight group consisting of Juventus Guerrero, Super Crazy, and <laughs> I forgot about this. This was a thing. The Mexicals. Psychosis should have been a sure it's the fire name. winner. After all, the three luchadors were all ultra talented, and their addition to the SmackDown roster in 2005 was a shot in the, the arm to Mexicals. a division that was thin on the ground and creatively neglected. However, WWE's decision to have the Mexicals ride to the ring. And a fucking John Deere lawn. <laughs> I say this all the time. It's a different time in wrestling, bro. Oh my god. On lawnmowers raised some eyebrows of due course. to it being, you know, a massive racist stereotype and yeah. deeply offensive oh to a sizable portion of the show's audience. What the Mexicals the claimed that they were no longer going to do the manual labor that Hispanics were expected to do for gringos and began their WWE <laughs> careers by interfering in matches by attacking other wrestlers. Their run got off to a pretty disastrous start when Hooventude smashed in Paul London's face with a botched 450 splash, Damn. leading to Vince McMahon outlawing the move and other high-risk maneuvers like the shooting star press. Their matches were also unfortunately underwhelming, and though Guerrero bagged the cruiserweight title, he alienated himself from the locker room with his characteristically annoying and erratic backstage behavior. Hoovy uh. soon lost the title and was released just six months after the Mexicals' debut, after which Crazy and Psychosis became a more palatable tag team. Number six, Damn. the Truth Commission. If I was asked to create the perfect stable, it would almost definitely include Mantar, Bull Buchanan, any one member of the oddities, and be managed by Don Callis. So why was the Truth Commission so resoundingly rubbish then? Starting life in the Memphis-based USWA territory, the Truth Commission was first managed by an actor Brett know who they are. in South Africa, though he was quickly replaced by the Jackal when the group of militias made its way to WWE TV. Part of 1997's Gang Wars storyline, their presence meant endless matches with the Nation of Domination, oh. DOA, and Los Bariquas, but the Truth Commission didn't have a compelling mission statement, nor the wrestling skill to make up for poor creative. Tank left the stable early on, leaving the interrogator, recon, and sniper to do the heavy lifting. The focus was clearly on making Kurgan a monster heel, and the two were basically bump dummies in green t-shirts and red hats. The matches were boring, the storylines were practically yeah. non-existent, and nobody was upset or cared or even noticed when the Truth Commission went away. <laughs> Number five, the social outcasts. Some That's tough when people don't even know, are they gone? I didn't even know. <laughs> that's, that's tough. Time <laughs> stables are simply thrown together to give hardworking but directionless members of the roster something to do. Mm -hmm. On occasion, this can work out great and lead to career revivals. 
the social outcasts was not one of these occasions. Mm -mm. On the first roar of 2016, Heath Slater introduced his newest stable since the I dissolution of the Three Man Band, revealing a coalition this. with Bo Dallas, Curtis Axel, and Adam Rose. Every member was a dependable lower mid-card guy that had experienced stop and start pushes and had come together to collectively reach for that elusive brass ring. Spoiler, they didn't reach it, nope. but they did have t-shirts with their group name and a hashtag on it, so that's something. The social outcasts did much of nothing, starting as heels before turning babyface and gradually falling apart, starting with Rose's suspension and inevitable mm. release. The group were never going to be world beaters, of course, but their seven-month existence yielded few highlights and failed to significantly elevate anyone involved. Nope. Just ask that tough enough idiot. Actually, I take <laughs> it back. At least we will always have their epic wrap-off with Flow Rider. That shiznit was so fire, I was almost sizzic all over my dizzle. Number four, Pretty Mean Sisters. There was so much cringe in what he just said right there. <laughs> if you thought the MSP were bad, wait until we dive into PMS, another of WWE's stable misfires circa 99. PMS stood for Pretty Mean Sisters, a group oh, wow. of scorned women who targeted the roster's menfolk. Of course, <laughs> it was all actually an allusion to premenstrual stress because the man behind the concept, Vince Russo, is nothing if not a feminist. Made up of Terry Runnels, Jacqueline, and in time, Ryan Shamrock, the sisters were involved in some of the worst storylines of the Attitude Era during their brief- And here's the thing, I, I know we tend to look at the Attitude Era with rose-tinted glasses, but there's some things I don't even remember this, but there are some things that just wasn't good. Even by those standards back then, there was a few things that just was not good. It would like just when you look back at some of these shows, some of these pay-per-views, you'd be like, damn, this wasn't good at all. But what worked is the main storylines. That's what ultimately made everyone forget about some of this awful stuff. The main storylines were so damn good that it, you look back on it like, damn, you, you remember it better than it actually was. So if existence, including Terry's faked miscarriage. There would have been worse to come in the form of a shamrock brother-sister romance had Ken not refused shortly before Ryan was released. By that point, PMS had added the hapless Sean Meat Stasiak as the group's love slave, who in the storyline got pasted in his matches because he was so knackered after being forced to fulfill the needs of his horny masters. Eventually, Jack... <laughs> that's, that's, that's a real thing, bro. He's forced to have sex with these women, then go out there to have a match. He ain't got no energy left. He's already stunned as soon as he get to the ring, as soon as he get hit with one punch. This is this is a real thing, y'all, bro. Kling got fed up with Terry um, wearing out and mistreating meat. The tipping point arriving when Runnels forced Stasiak to kiss her foot following a loss to Edge on Sunday Night Heat, signaling the end of the group. A tale as old as time itself. Number three, The Core. The oh, Nexus was a great this. idea that started well and led to some fantastic television, at least initially. Handled correctly, they could have become one of the greatest stables of all time, Facts. and their main members could have easily become main event level stars. Well, Nexus wasn't handled correctly and nope. fizzled out after several months of irredeemable booking. CM Punk took over the reins of the black and yellow group, kicking out Barrett, Slater, and Gabriel, and forming the new Nexus, mm -hmm. while the exiled members hooked up with former ECW champion Ezekiel Jackson to form the core. That's spelled with two R's, by the way, so you know they mean business. I can see the sense in trying to give the four of them something to do, but the whole concept of the core, if you can even call it a concept, felt like it was scribbled down on a fast food napkin and handed Facts. to Wade and the boys five minutes before their first promo together. Didn't Incredibly, work. the core managed to snatch the Intercontinental and Tag Team titles, but if you want to know how successful they really were, check out their 90 second loss at WrestleMania 27. Number it two, didn't, the uni. It didn't work as what they expected it to be. And this is just a product of them not getting the right booking when they were in the Nexus. You know, like it, it's kind of hard to buy into some people that just got kicked out of the new version of a group you were just in. Granted, yeah, they won some, uh, some, some gold at some point. But when you really think about it, it still didn't really, 
helped him get over. Nobody really talks about the core. If anything, they talk about the Nexus and the new Nexus with CM Punk, but no one just be like, oh, the core, that was a great group. Great stable. No. Union. The only union you're likely to ever see in a WWE locker room is the one that was made up of Mankind, Big Show, Ken Shamrock, and Test in May of 1999. The Union, or to give them their full title, The Union of People You Ought to Respect, Son, aka Up Yours, because it's, <laughs> it's Russo's world we're living that. in and everything is a forced pun, were a short-lived offshoot of the corporation. The foursome abandoned the corporation after Shane McMahon wrangled power away from his father and began to treat certain members badly. The union was sort of aligned with other heavy hitters, including Mr. McMahon, Steve Austin, The Rock, and Commissioner Shawn Michaels, and battled the corporate ministry after The Undertaker's satanic outfit merged with Shane's crew. Mm. This all led to a union versus corporate ministry eight-man elimination tag match at the ill-fated Over the Edge, which was won by Mankind. Eight days later, Mrs. Foley's baby boy was written off TV in order to get knee surgery. One week after that, Vince McMahon was revealed yeah. as the higher power and with their leader on the shelf and their enemy morphing into a confusing mess, the union turned in their two by fours and went their separate ways. Number one, retribution. Yep, you you know, it, it Vince inserting himself. It was me all along. It was like, okay, what, what's what's happening here? <laughs> so much twist and turns. Did that need to be? The, did that need to be a turn? Pandemic era was an unprecedented time for WWE, one of the very few sports or entertainment enterprises that kept running throughout. Mm -hmm. The lack of a live crowd and absence of key personnel led to some, shall we say, interesting creative choices. <laughs> interesting, eyeball. unfortunately, is not something that the Retribution stable can be accused of being. Like the Nexus before them, Retribution were dismayed at the WWE system and wanted yeah. to take it down from within, causing property damage and attacking people at random like a bunch of masked asbos. None of it felt right from the off, with the stable stupid outfits and slapdash names. Hold on, wasn't one of them called slapdash? No, sorry, slapjack, wasn't it? Yeah, much yeah. better. Anyway, as I was saying, their attire, monikers, motivations, it was all positively rotten. Yeah. WWE and the members of Retribution, that's Ali, Mace, T-Bar, Reckoning, Retaliation, and our old pal Slapjack, thank you very much, <laughs> ought to be thankful this sorry episode took place away from packed arenas as I would have waged my entire Hasbro collection that it would have died a death in front of them. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, it still died a death, but at least it was only to the sound of Kevin Dunn's piped-in Thunderdome crowd noise. Yeah, Retribution, it, it looked promising, but it didn't go absolutely nowhere. I was, you know, they tried. It just, it was just like, what the hell is this, bro? What? 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 what and then when you see the fucking fake bane mask and i was just like oh my god like they tried it just wasn't successful and they that's the part of the wrestling business sometimes you try something it doesn't work so you gotta go back to the drawing board and trying to figure out something else so comment down below let me know is there a stable that you feel like should have been on this list that is just awful and it doesn't even have to be uh in wwe it could be in whatever um wrestling company aew or wherever else independent uh scene you felt like the stable just did not work at all let me know down below but i appreciate all the love and support you guys are showing on the channel road to 150k and i am still your undisputed youtube wrestling champ of the world appreciate y'all kicking me see y'all next one peace